Now, Christianity has its 13th apostle, a faithful witness to the love, mercy, and truth of Jesus Christ. How about you? Will you be the 13th apostle? Don't you know, we're talking about a revolution sounds Don't you know, talking about a revolution it sounds like a whisper While they're standing in the welfare lines Crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation Wasting time in the unemployment lines Sitting around, waiting for a promotion Don't you know, talking about a revolution it sounds Get their share. Who are people gonna rise up and take what's there? Better Revolution, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the, another episode of the 13th Apostle. Where we explore the good, the beautiful and true of the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church. This is Tom Caffrey with my co-host Dan Duddy. Hey, Dan. Hey, Tom. How are you, buddy? All right. How you doing? Excellent. Excellent. You get uh, a little juice by that song by Tracy Chapman, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my my mind went about a thousand miles down down the road. The whole concept of revolution has piqued a whole lot of interest in me, and some questions I'd like to share with our great guest today. Go yeah, ahead, Tom. Larry Chap, yep, uh, Catholic worker, farmer, and uh, Dr. Larry yeah, Chap. That's me. Uh, he's he's back. Hey, Larry, right. you got me scared. I'm I'm going to appeal to another Tracy Chapman song. You got a fast car. Oh, Larry, <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> when Dan said he was a thousand miles down the road, I said, "Man, that's a perfect segue to fast cars." You are that's good. That's the other side. Yeah, you run, are run, good. Run, run to, to a fast car. Yep. Wow, absolutely. But I'm glad to be here. Very glad to be here again. Oh, glad to have you, Thank yeah. you. We got some good feedback uh, about our uh, episode, so uh, looking forward to another great conversation and subsequent conversations from the feedback. So uh, I'll say that while the essence of the church is Christ, okay, in word and in, in, in all the sacraments, and is therefore perfect. Mm -hmm. The people responsible for helping him build the kingdom of God on earth uh, are not. So, in the first episode, we talked about that uh, German word, I believe, right, uh, Larry? Ernstfall? The Ernstfall, yes, the moment of decision in crisis. Thus, the reason for this uh, playing this song, talking about a revolution. Now, Yes. I really, I think that uh, we talked about this is, you know, you're, as I said, a Catholic worker farmer, the Catholic worker farm modeled after what Dorothy Day, the servant of God, and her mentor and great friend, and the guy who I think you, in your book, Confession of a Catholic Worker by Ignatius Press, you seem to be championing in him, which I loved. It's, yeah. I'm not, whether he's in, I don't know whether you would describe him at, at at any time in his life as the downtrodden, but you seem to be his champion. And tell us why. Well, part of it, yeah, mainly because I think he's a very neglected figure in the Catholic Worker movement. I mean, Dorothy Day gets all of the accolades. It's it's her cause that's up for canonization, and all rightly so. None of thing that I write is meant to denigrate Dorothy Day. I love Dorothy Day. But I just think it's a shame, you know, Peter was older than she was, and he died essentially of dementia, Alzheimer's, in the late 40s. And so, you know, he kind of quickly got forgotten in the movement of things. So, you know, I do like his message, and I kind of wanted to retrieve it and resurrect it for the sake of a modern audience. Right before the uh, we went on the air, we were talking about this and that, and I brought up uh, your reference to... Uh 
uh, to St. Augustine. And, uh, you know, his rallying, certainly the new Christians, uh, some older Christians, because it was uh, well enough after, uh, long enough after Constantine uh, stopped the, uh, well, I think, generally speaking, we say stopped most of the, uh, of the persecution. I'm sure there were pockets of it, looking at this or that yeah. text. But you said in the book that the difference between then and now this is we'd say, okay, let's draw the comparison between the fall of Rome and the fall of America, let's say, is that the Christians uh, had something to build upon. So in yes. contrast to what we don't have now. So talk about that, please. I mean, yeah, you can look at even St. Paul, you know, where he talks about how he went to the Areopagus, you know, in, in Athens and preached to them about the unknown God. And the fact is, is that pagans, though having the pagan Romans, polytheistic and all that sort of thing, even though they had a very different religious system than the Christians did, they at least had a very strong and powerful religious sense. To them, the, the world of spirits, the world of the supernatural, the world of divinity was very, very real, except for them it was something to be feared which is why the gospel was good news because the good news was that christ had vanquished the powers of the air that pagans feared the principalities and powers that the pagans feared the gods were after all rather capricious and arbitrary and all these kinds of things and you didn't really want to develop a warm and fuzzy relationship with them you wanted to manipulate them to get them to do what you wanted or at least get out of their way but they had a strong religious sense so along comes christianity and after the fall of the roman empire you know augustine in the city of god is reminding people there's something to build on here okay there's something to build on whereas in modern times the crisis we face uh is radically different from that we face a crisis of an almost you know, erased religious sense. The religious sense, like all of our senses, has to be cultivated. And if it's not cultivated, it's it's not going to die completely, but it's going to be like a fire with only just a few low burning embers left that you really, really have to do a lot of work at to retrieve that fire. Uh, and our religious sense is thinned out. It's It's suppressed. It's not developed like an unused muscle or some unused part of your brain. It's just atrophied. And so that's the hardest thing I think that modern Christian evangelists, Catholic evangelists have to confront, is the fact that people are radically indifferent in many, many cases to religion in general, and Christianity in particular. That's the crisis we face. What you got there, Danny? Absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm going to go back to the, it was a great song, Tom, it brings us right to, you know, what Larry writes about generally. In this revolution that we're facing, if we're going to allow it, depending on which way we're looking at the revolution, who's actually doing the marching here uh, and doing the chanting and the singing, like we could either be the pitchers, you know, asserting ourselves and start a revolution, or we could be the catchers of such, and we could hang back and kind of like be victimized by it. And I think we are called to, you know, discern which side we're going to take begin to understand the enemy, being a football coach, but not spend too much time on the enemy. Instead, figure out what our offense is. And I love how, and I've told you this before, you paint the picture of the enemy in the beginning of your book, and then you give us hope, Larry, and you start to come toward evangelization, which which I really do enjoy. And I, I, I think I talked about Strickland with regards to the, the Dodgers slop that happened. You're talking about Bishop, uh, uh, Bishop how, Strickland, right, Dan? Bishop Strickland, yeah. Of Tyler, yeah. Texas. Yeah, exactly. And he called us back to becoming first century Christians, where, where you were just a couple of minutes ago, to some degree, that we should borrow from our Protestant brothers and sisters for the fundamental rule that Christ is our personal Lord and Savior, and we need to go there and live in Christ again. And that's the best way to recause the revolution that happened with our first century Christians. But here, here's something I wanted to ask you, Larry. So you left education 20 years ago as a theology professor at a university. And in the last episode, you briefly expressed that your time there was becoming, shall I say, a difficult cause. And I know you're referring generally to youth, colleges, academia in general, but you have now in many ways literally turned to the dirt with what you've done with the Catholic worker inspired by Dorothy Day, which is antithetical perhaps to your university work. And uh, yeah, is, there, yeah. is, there, is there a side of you that feels tugged to go back to the students? And if so, 
how would you capture their attention at this point? Like, you know, I, I just a, as an elementary example, I would have a, I would have pizza for free after school to get all the athletes in the building to come into here. Uh, a talk on, you know, stuff that I was doing for the Catholic Athletes for Christ. But what is it that we can do? I, and I don't I'm not looking for pizza as the answer. What is the bait that we can use to get the attention of our students today coming from you with all your experience? How would we do that today? Oh God! Well, that's there's no easy formulaic answer to that. You know, when I when I left teaching ten years ago, it was still possible to do certain things. One of the one of the problems now. I did go back to my former university, to Sales University, very very briefly uh, to fill in for somebody about uh, four years ago, three years ago now. And what I discovered was that in the seven years since I had quit teaching, a lot had changed with modern students. There were certain uh, forms of humor certain sarcastic comments and these kinds of that I used to be able to make, I would no longer be able to do because of trigger warnings and woke culture and cancel culture uh, that these kids are immersed in. Uh, I was absolutely struck by how within a decade there had been this enormous change. So that then raises the question of what to do. Uh, you mentioned first century. One of the interesting things is this. One of the reasons why the first Christians were persecuted wasn't because their religion was different from the Romans. The Romans had widespread religious freedom. You could worship your big toe or the fuzz on your hair, on your head, if you wanted to. It didn't matter to the Romans. They had all manner of disgusting and weird religions. They would add, however, your religion to the pantheon of their gods and worship that too just to cover all their bases. No, the difference with the Christians is the Christians were saying all these other gods are false. All of these other gods are an illusion. There's only one God, and he is the God of Jesus Christ, and Christ is, mm. is, is God. So the Romans, in their pagan religiosity, they said, they feared the gods. And so anytime something bad happened to the Roman Empire, the Romans surmised that it's because the Christians had made the gods angry. In other words, the first Christians were persecuted by being called atheists. And atheists in the sense that you are antisocial. Antisocial. You are a destructive, anti-human social force because you were undermining you were undermining the spiritual foundations of this empire. Now segue to the modern world. This is exactly what modern Christians are being accused of again, only not out of any kind of pagan religiosity, but because we're violating now the central dogmas of modernity, the central dogmas of woke culture, LGBTQ this, transgender that, you may not say this. So we're once again being labeled antisocial, dangerous, bigots, all those kinds of things. Now, that's what our students now think of us. This is the problem we face in confronting modern days, and, and we're evangelizing them. So one of the, the hurdles we have to overcome is the stigma that we, we are the antisocial ones, that they represent civilization and we represent anti-civilization. So what I like to say is we have to find a way to flip the script. We have to find a way to flip that around in the minds of modern day students. Mm-hmm. And the and I and I, and I think the way that we have to do it, the way we have to do it is by being what's the word the kids themselves by being a bit punk, by being punk meaning you're you're not you're not afraid to be a bit outrageous, you're not afraid mm-hmm. to get right, right back in their face, to, mm-hmm. to not not afraid but not offensively, not vulgarly, but mm-hmm. to have spine, to have backbone, to show them to understand their doubts and their issues, their concepts of civilization better than they do. Better than they do. So that when yeah. they articulate the objections to you, mm. you can say, hey, let me steel man that for you. You're not even voicing your own objection strongly enough. Here's the real the real meat in your objection. And then go on to defang it. Then go on to confront it. And then go on to say, but here's what I say. Here's why I think you're wrong about this. But in a very friendly, avuncular you know, way that, that is non-threatening. And to be aware that some people are just going to walk away. Some people are just going to shut you down because they don't want to hear what you have to say. Mm-hmm. Excellent point. I've heard you said, and Tom, just let me say this one thing because it relates so much to the locker room. It real, it, and you said it so so succinctly. Flip the script, deconstruct the BS. And what I'm hearing yeah. is you got to have that little bit of a chip on your shoulder to go into the BS, right, Larry? Yeah. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Deconstruct the BS. I love it. Go ahead, Tom. You use the word deconstruct. It's kind of like a spy versus spy going back and forth who can deconstruct whom and uh, at what at what pace uh, because so much of modernity and where we are today is deconstructing 
well, the institutions uh, that uh, that we've had, uh, and and we got to be careful. I'm not comfortable with certain blanket statements, like, and now you refer to these uh, in your uh, later in your book uh, in the chapter on. Uh, uh, exploding, uh, blowing up the dynamite of the church. Uh, it's uh, chapter six, the Catholic worker movement, blowing up the dynamite of the church. And to, to look at what we have assumed are strong pillars of our society and our culture, but it's part of the whole, the, the whole cloth uh, you, you write about the corporatism, the, uh, the militarism, uh, scientism, you know, and yeah. that those are whether or not they, they they're the, the the consumerism. I mean, two two thirds of the American economy is consumerism. So if we don't buy as much, yeah. do people lose their jobs because companies lay them off? Uh, so this is you talked about the uh, the uh, it wasn't the church, it wasn't it wasn't the Catholic priest who developed the uh, Zyklon B. And uh, it wasn't the church, it wasn't the priest who developed, uh, exploded atomic bomb, killing hundreds of thousands. And, yeah. you know, this, uh, this is, uh, the people today don't, they don't know that. They don't know that, or, and if it's, they're told that, that's where the pushback comes, but it's typically emotion, it's not, it's not thought. So, again, this is a challenge for us when somebody says, I don't want to, my, I don't want my father to lose his job. Because uh, we didn't buy enough uh, from Amazon. Okay. How do we well, do that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, we have, in some ways, we have more, more power than we think we do. If we could just organize. I mean, this is one of Dorothy and Peter's main points in starting the Catholic Worker Movement. is that Christians need to organize themselves into forms of, of resistance. For example, Christians, for example, are constantly complaining uh, that modern day Christmas has been de-Christianized. You go out to all the retail stores, nobody says Merry Christmas, it's Happy Holidays, or because you don't want to offend X, Y, Z, or whatever. But here's the deal. If Christians simply said, say, starting in 2024, uh, we are not going to buy Christmas presents for anyone until retail establishments start putting Christ back in Christmas, because it is, after all, a Christian holiday. Okay? They wouldn't do that with any other religion. Rosh Hashanah, Ramadan, they'll explicitly mention the religious roots of those religions in retail establishments. But they refrain, they refrain from mentioning the Christian roots of Christian because they don't want to offend people. That implies Christianity is offensive. And therefore, if Christians stop buying anything at Christmas, those retail establishments would collapse because they so depend on Christmas money. But we don't do things like that. We just shrink in the face of things. We're happy to throw these little complaints from afar, but we never organize ourselves enough to really stand up to these sorts of things. Same with certain narratives that we get. Religions cause wars, the Inquisition, and all these kinds of things. Well, no wars have compared. No religious war ever in the history of anybody anywhere compares to the genocidal, catastrophic, monstrous wars perpetrated by non-religious governments in the 20th and 21st century. The greatest, most horrific genocides have been perpetrated by non-religious regimes. And that's the point I was trying to make in that chapter. It wasn't a priest that developed the nerve to gas Jews. It was a scientist working with the Nazis. It wasn't a, a Protestant minister that developed the atomic bomb and incinerated 200,000 Japanese civilians. All right? That, that were scientists working with the secular American government. And this is what I mean about flipping the script, organizing ourselves, being a bit punk being a bit in your face. Now, this doesn't mean being unfriendly at all. It can all be done in extremely non-unfriendly ways, let's put it that way. And the, and the manner to do this, by not being defensive, by not being immediately angry, but doing it all out of a sense of, well, we just got to do this. This is These are our principles, and we have to stand up for them, and it's what we're going to do. So we could model Christ. the culture uh, yeah. after the Bud Light experience. Jeez. You know, I'm, yes, I'm right? glad you brought that I mean, up. They, it, was, because, it was successful. Uh, I, I'm often telling people, what is it that sparked this whole Bud Light thing? It can't just be about Dylan Mulvaney, the transgender dude. Okay, it can't just be about that. What happened was, I think that once once the the backlash began, 
conservative traditional Americans decided to make an example of Budweiser, of how it is that we can band together and make a difference. This exact kind of organizational smack back to, to the dominant culture. And all of a sudden, Budweiser is suddenly now kowtowing to all those so-called rednecks that it was just making fun of. Okay. Because those rednecks stopped buying their really awful beer. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> On all counts. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I love how you uh, how you bring us from the uh, complex uh, abstracts of this crazy, all these crazy intangibles of the culture. And you keep coming back to the dirt where I live, my friend, the truth. You know, yeah. you bring, bring us back to Christ. It always seems to me that simplicity beats complexity, you know, and God's creation beats self creation. So, uh, yeah, man, good well, stuff. Tom, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to, one one thing. It, it, it it's an interesting, uh, perhaps a little dilemma here. You know the book that came out several years ago, the Benedict Option. In your oh, yeah, book. I know Rod Dreher. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure whether you were inferring some. You, I don't. I didn't see a reference to the Benedict Option. I did see your references to Saint Benedict and what he did in response to the fall of the Roman Empire. And I wonder if because some people some. Christians, some Catholics had a problem with uh, Dreyer and his Benedict option to say, okay, well, you're just removing yourself. And I believe they didn't understand his work, but they said, you're just removing yourself. You're not, you're telling everybody to be, you're not going to be a part. You're going to ghettoize yourself. And I don't know whether it's yeah. a fine line between St. Benedict starting the mon uh, monastic tradition, the Western monastic tradition, and ghettoizing himself and his, uh, his followers. Tell us what you think about uh, well, yeah, I like Rod Dreher. You know, I have certain issues with him, of course, but I think he's a decent fellow. And I like Benedict Option. And I think it is a misunderstood book. It's misunderstood exactly as ghettoization, retreat, flee to the hills. And it isn't. It's simply, it's a, it's a book about identity. It's a book about you're not going to be, able, there's an old Latin phrase, nemo dot quod non hobbit. You can't give what you don't possess. You can't give away what you don't possess. And so mm -hmm. Rod Dreher is saying, unless we understand our Catholic, our Christian faith, Unless we retrieve that, unless we band together in intentional communities and reforge Christian civilization as, as the Benedictines originally did, we're not going to be able to confront the modern world. That's for Roger. Now, I didn't bring it up on purpose simply because I know it's a controversial book in the minds of a lot of people. In the minds of a lot of people, it does represent ghettoization. So I just, I didn't mention it. I think, I figured people would, you know, just like you did, would put two and two together mm -hmm. and, and figure out that, that there's something very similar going on between what I'm saying and what he's saying. I do think, however, if there is a difference between my approach and his, is I, I do think that there's a slight element of, and this might surprise people who've been listening to me so far, that I think there's too much of an us versus them mentality in Rod's book in the Benedict option. Mm. There's too much of a drawing of a sharp distinction between us and them. The fact is we're infected with the same virus that most of our contemporaries are. And there's no fleeing the fact that we are so infected. And and, and so I, I, I think it's better, yes, we need identity. We need intentional community. We need deep faith. But I also think that we need to instead of drawing sharp lines of distinction between us and them, we need to actually, I'm trying to avoid cliches, but we need to engage our neighbor. We need to engage them positively, constructively as friends, as non-enemies, as non-others, you know, that the people that I, I work with or family members or, or whatever, you're just, you're just another person who thinks differently than I do. And you're not an enemy. And, and, and I know that's probably a bit of a caricature of Rod's position, but I do think there's too much of an us versus them in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. your way is, um, I, I, I know, I think that, that, well, Peter Morin's way might be a little more uh, labor intensive than uh, Dreyer's. Uh, no milking of uh, cows in Dreyer's uh, yeah. counties, right? Yeah. Uh, Dan, I think Dan no. would do well in, uh, uh, in the farm. He would do well. You know, why is that, Tom? Yeah, this, Here I am. I'm sure Larry's got plenty of dirt in his uh, at his farm. So. <laughs> Let's go. I'm all in. Well, well, it's small, just... but the, I mean, it's a small farm. It's only about uh, 11 acres. So it, it's it's more of a homestead than a farm. People sometimes get the image of me out plowing up 80 acres to plant soybeans <laughs> or something. And uh, it, it's not that. It's a glorified homestead. So 
it should be called the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Homestead instead of farm in some ways, but we love it here. Well, you know, Americans like to shorten things, so homestead is uh, too long. Uh, farm works uh, works better for our nickname is your mind. So uh, this is wonderful, Larry. It's uh, another great conversation, and just we're just touching, ladies and gentlemen. We are just touching on the content uh, of this book, even though it's been two episodes. There is so much uh, uh, in this. And thank you, Larry, for, for doing that. And thank you for doing this, for appearing on the 13th Apostle again. Enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, I enjoy it. We're going to do it again. We'll do it again. So, yeah, man. Well, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. All Beautiful. right. Let's thank you, Larry. Okay. okay. Bye. Thanks, Larry. Take care. Talk soon. Larry Chap, ladies and gentlemen, author of Confession of a Catholic Worker, published by Ignatius Press. And always. Thank Ignatius for their uh, review copies and for Andrea Boring, especially for uh, helping to set up this uh, great conversation. So uh, thanks to all. Danny, what is coming up next? Wow, what an, another great conversation with Larry Chap. Okay, folks, uh, stay tuned for The Angelus. And following The Angelus is Your Prayer Intentions with Peter and Jemmy. WQPHradio.org. Spread the word. Help Larry, help Dan, help Tom, and help all of us. Help the station. Let's uh, get out. Uh, let's get out there. Let's be laborers and uh, help build the kingdom of God. God bless Amen. you, Danny. God bless you, Tommy, and God bless you all. You are listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. And now a word from author Peter and Jimmy, who is the host of Your Prayer Intentions, taking place every Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Whether you're donating money or giving us prayers, without you, we don't go on. And if you do want to help us go on, please consider going to WQPH radio.org there's a donate button there you can give once you can give monthly and it makes a difference it keeps all of our shows and we have a great lineup of shows keeps us going and whether you're a fan of uh your prayer intentions whether you like steve's show benedict's hammer sundays at midnight whether you like brother matthew and brother anthony from from the housetops which is on sundays 10 30 a.m and 4 p.m whether you're a fan of the children's rosary which we have every day at 5 p.m seven days a week whether you like our local matter show which is saturday at 11 or talk catholic which comes right after us at 12 30 larry's music up sunday at 11 a.m we have the Shepherd's Pie Saturdays at 1 p.m. Or Dan and Tom with the 13th Apostle, which comes just before us at 11.30. Any of those shows and all the stuff you, you donate, you help these things come out. But what also at the WQPH website, in addition to podcasts of our shows, is the prayer wall. Right on the prayer wall, support WQPH and get WQPH 24 hours a day, seven days a week on WQPHradio.org. Thank you for listening to The 13th Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey. For more information on Dan, visit his website at www.danduddy.com or email dcduddy at gmail.com. Tom's website is faithpilgrims.com or email trcaffrey at faithpilgrims.com. How about you? Will you be The 13th Apostle? 